listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple and wherever you get your podcasts. everybody and welcome to another episode of Living with ADHD and CPTSD. This is the final episode of season one and it's hard to believe that I had just started my first season on September 11th of 2021 and gee I'm nearly at a year and so season one is ending as of today and then at the beginning of September which will be September 2nd, 2022, will be season two. And there's going to be some minor changes. Nothing major, no format change necessarily or anything. I'm just making some adjustments just to freshen it up and try to keep things interesting for people. I don't know the specifics necessarily yet, but I know that it will be exciting and different is always good for a lot of things. Anyway, today is a CPTSD episode, and a fitting way to end season one is to talk about how the effects of complex trauma is on brain development. I've been humming and hawing about what I could do for the final episode of the first season. Uh, I was even thinking about maybe getting a really good interview with someone, an expert, but unfortunately it just wasn't meant to be. So I'm going to talk about brain development when it comes to complex trauma and how it affects it. I'm going to discuss the brain development in general, and then I will also discuss some important things regarding areas of the brain that is, are discussed, and I will go further into them. So first off, before I get into it, let me just give you a quick reminder on what complex trauma is, of course. Complex trauma occurs either in childhood or in early teenage years when a person that we love or trust, whether it's our parents, it's a guardian, it could be a teacher, uh, a childcare expert, someone who's basically looking after the child, uh, whose the child's needs are needing to be met and that person repeatedly takes advantage of them and abuses them, whether it's emotionally, physically, sexually, um, you know, in any way. And also it can happen from repeated traumatic events that are not necessarily abuse, but it also could be neglect and where we are not getting our needs met. And we are, a lot of times, those who have complex trauma tend to be raised by narcissistic people. And sometimes they are also raised by parents who themselves have trauma of their own from childhood or, po- or just post-traumatic stress disorder and don't take care of it. And so they take it out on their children and then their children create, you know, develop complex trauma as well. So now there's been a lot of recent development and the study on CPTSD is still new. There's not exactly a ton of information out there when you were compared to something like PTSD, ADHD, dyslexia, other, other mental illnesses. Complex trauma is a newer kind of mental illness that is just really starting to get a grasp in society today. And to be quite honest, we need to really get it out there and get it more more known and widely understood. Because there's going to be a lot of people who in the next decade or so are going to be diagnosed with CPTSD because the awareness and the exposure 
of this online in society in social media and things like my podcast and other podcasts it is becoming more and more aware uh, around everybody so more people are going to start to understand and realize that they may have it and end up getting diagnosed so we need to have more research done and more understanding of on CPTSD okay enough of that here's the article I'm going to read this and then I'm going to go into specifics on three different areas that are brought up in this article all right, the article is The Effects of Complex Trauma on Brain Development. Exposure to complex trauma in early childhood leads to structural and functional brain changes. Structural changes alter the volume or size of specific brain regions. Proven structural changes include enlargement of the amygdala, the alarm center of the brain, and shrinkage of the hippocampus, a brain area critical to remembering the story of what happened during a traumatic experience. Functional changes alter activity of certain brain regions. These include overproduction of stress hormones in childhood that can wear down the immune system and lead to depletion by adulthood of hormones necessary to tolerate and recover from stressful situations encountered in daily life. I think they missed a word there. It should be necessary to tolerate. Many such abnormalities identified through neuroimaging that have previously been attributed to psychiatric illness have been scientifically proven to be the result of prior childhood maltreatment. Timing and type of trauma matters. Implicated brain regions in interconnecting pathways have been found to have sensitive periods in childhood when they are most vulnerable to the effects of trauma exposure. In addition, exposure to specific forms of complex trauma, trauma excuse me, in childhood, including neglect, emotional and verbal abuse, sexual abuse, and witnessing domestic family violence, that's another one, I didn't think of that one, has been shown to have distinct effects on specific brain regions. Complex trauma changes the brain for worse or better. The effects on brain development caused by exposure to complex trauma in childhood have been associated with psychopathology, maladaptive coping, and heightened behavioral and risk health risk trajectories. The good news. Nevertheless, there is an interesting wrinkle to this story. Leading neuroscientists, foremost among them, Dr. Martin Teacher, or Teicher, at Harvard University have demonstrated on the basis of considerable research that many of these seemingly negative effects are best understood as survival-based alterations that are actually highly adaptive. In other words, while these changes in the brain are associated with a number of problems, they came about to help people survive in the face of ongoing trauma as well as to anticipate and prepare for living in a world that continues to be dangerous and hostile. Are trauma-related brain changes permanent, or can they be reversed? Previously presumed to represent irreversible damage, neuroscientific research has begun to suggest that some structural changes to the brain caused by exposure to complex trauma are reversible. Individual studies have demonstrated the capacity to reverse negative alterations in certain important brain structures. For example, corrective repair to reductions in volume or size have been observed for these important brain structures. White matter, the connective bundles that relay and communication between different brain regions. Hippocampus, an important part of the limbic system involved in consolidation of memories. Then there is the fascinating series on studies of telomeres, the protective caps at the ends of each chromosome that are necessary for DNA replication, which is in turn is which in turn, excuse me, is essential to for all living things, including humans, to keep living. Accelerated erosion of telomeres have been linked, sorry, has been linked to exposure to complex childhood trauma and implicated in premature mortality in humans. Wow. 
However, there is good news. Emerging research has begun to reveal the power of meditation-based interventions, in particular to restore telomeres and reverse this otherwise deadly alteration to the brain brought on by early life stress. All right, now I'm going to read a few things that were mentioned in the article so I can give you a bit more specific rundown on certain areas. Okay, so amygdala, the alarm center of the brain responsible for threat detection, registering fear and sending a distress signal that leads to activation of the body's emergency survival, the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn response. Neuroscientific research has demonstrated that exposure to chronic abuse in childhood contributes to enlargement of this brain structure. Hippocampus, the archivist of the brain, responsible for memory encoding and storage. Its functioning can be compromised by exposure to trauma, leading to fragmentation and incomplete memory for the story of what happened. Telomeres, caps of DNA at the end of chromosomes necessary for cell replication of living organisms. Accelerated telomera erosion has been linked to cumulative and complex childhood trauma and implicated in premature mortality. Previously thought to be permanent, emerging research suggests that potential for mindfulness-based meditation to reverse telomere damage. Wow. That's actually quite... That's pretty cool. Historical trauma, a broad term, term referring to the cumulative effects of traumatic experiences spanning multiple generations, impacting either a particular family or an entire community, culture, or people. Linked to greater contemporary disease prevalence, health disparities, social marginalization, poverty, and risk outcomes. The current generation bears the cumulative grief and loss of all those that came before. In many instances, aspects of historical trauma continue in present day through overt or covert forms of oppression and discrimination, often used interchangeably with the term ancestral trauma. All right, I just thought I'd throw that in because that was that is a really related thing because I did mention that a lot of times parents are the ones that tend to often bring the trauma onto their children due to their own issues with complex trauma and other related issues like post-traumatic stress disorder. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, the reason that I wanted to bring this up and because not only was it an interesting article and it is something that should be made a, made more public because a lot of people out there and I have read it on Twitter quite often believe that there is no end in sight and there's no chance for recovery that now that we have this complex trauma that we're going to deal with it and be stuck with it for the rest of our lives and the reality is that there and there is evidence out there that with the right work and putting in the hard work and this is over many many years and doing all the processing and doing the healing and the reprogramming of your mind that complex trauma you can be cured from it where to the point that you will no longer have triggers you will no longer have flashbacks and the CPTSD can be forever gone from within your mind but in order for that to happen you need to have the right kind of therapy you need to have the right sort of work and you need to do the hard work on your own and with your therapist this is not an easy thing this is not going to be a quick fix uh, you can't go to the therapist and have 12 sessions with him and do some homework and do some EMDR and whatever other formats that they think are going to be necessary or helpful. And then expect yourself to have no more triggers and no more trauma or flashbacks. That's just not realistic. 
the cure is occurring in a multi, like over multiple years. Like a lot of therapists who discuss CPTSD and who are experts on this say that <clears throat> depending on the amount of therapy you do and the amount of work that you do with your system and the hard work you put in, it does take about five to 10 years to get enough progress made that you can heal yourself and no longer deal with CPTSD. Now, I'm not saying that this is an automatic for every single person. It's not a 100% guarantee. Every single person out there who has CPTSD is going to get cured, but a lot of it depends on you. It's not up to the therapist. The therapist can do the work he is sorry he may or may not be the expert it is a possibility because there are not exactly a lot of psychologists or even psychiatrists necessarily whose expertise is cptsd and so sometimes there are people out there and i have seen evidence not only online but with people that i have talked to where They've done the they've done the therapy and to them it feels like it's gotten worse instead of you know them getting better. And most of this, of course, is because of the incorrect type of therapy that they're doing. Now, there's a lot of evidence out there, and if you look online, you do some research, you can discover and find it that therapy like CBT is more harmful than good for someone who has complex trauma because complex trauma and CBT don't match. They don't work. You need to do certain things that are effective and certain things that are effective are EMDR, um, using structural dissociation model or structural dissociation theory has been very effective. If you're not aware of what this is, and that is because it is a very recently new theory that is that is out there, there is some research. I also have done a podcast previously a few months ago regarding structural dissociation theory specifically as the topic. So you can go and find that one if you would like to listen to it to get some more information. You can also do the research online and look for it. Just you're going to have to do a lot of looking because it's not exactly straight up front and in your face like a lot of other stuff. I have talked about the methods and the work and how you do structural association theory model work. And it's very effective if you do it right and you know how to do it. And that's where you do need a therapist in order to properly learn the method and make it effective. Because... It's, it's very easy to get misunderstood and not really know how to deal with it, like how, how to make it truly effective. And so you just need to find a therapist whose expertise is CPTSD and does structural dissociation theory. That's the best way to do it. Okay, I have another article um, sort of similar to the first one that I read. I'm going to read it. I want to give you more insight on to how CPTSD damages the brain. Okay. Now, the only thing that I do not agree with this, this beginning is it says that repeated trauma causes permanent damages in brain processing centers. It's not necessarily 100% true. It can, but it also can be repaired as long as, like I said earlier, you do the work and you be very you know, hard on it and make sure that you do it. Okay, so complex post-traumatic stress disorder and how it damages the brain. Right. A friend recently told a story about being worried about her taxi driver and the effort she went to pl placate him or placate him so that he wouldn't flake out on her. Now, lots of women have experienced this sort of thing. And appeasement is a behavior most of us adopt at some point in our lives. It's not her story that was unusual. It was my reaction to it. While other women in our group nodded and shared experiences, 
My heart rate increased dramatically. My breath quickened and I found myself clenching my fists. I wasn't having a panic attack. I had been triggered. In my emotional distress, I barked out, I have been clutching a pen in my fist in case he tried, he decided to do so, to try something. Oh my God, I should be right. I should re-read that. Excuse me. I barked out, I have been clutching a pen in my fist in case he decided to try something. A couple of women laughed, but most of them recognized a trauma response, though they may not have known what to call it. Complex PTSD or CPTSD is a condition in which a person who has experienced multiple or prolonged traumatic events develops symptoms similar to those of PTSD, which changes the way their brains work. Also referred to as complex trauma, happens over a period of time, often months or years, rather than resulting from a particular event, as is common with PTSD. While PTSD can develop following the experience of any kind of physical, emotional, or psychological damage, such as the death of a loved one, physical assault, witnessing a tragedy, or experiencing it firsthand, the development of CPTSD is usually linked to repeated experiences. Causes Childhood abuse or neglect, domestic violence or emotional abuse, repeated sexual or physical assault, experiencing human trafficking, living in an area affected by war, and prolonged exposure to combat or being a prisoner of war. Although a lot of that last one tends to be more PTSD. All right. I grew up in a home run by two chronic and emotionally unstable alcoholics. To say that my life was chaotic would be an understatement. I only have two memories of life before age six. Seeing the black horse in JFK's funeral on TV and an image of flashing lights and loud banging noises. With the help of a psychiatrist and the stories from relatives, I've surmised that the lights and banging are my recollections of police responding to domestic disturbance calls at my house. I've suffered years of emotional and cognitive problems, ranging from ADD to borderline personality disorder. I've been in psychotherapy nonstop for the past 15 years and have been hospitalized in a psychiatric facility a number of times. I've also attempted suicide twice. Plenty of people, some professional, some not, told me there was something wrong with me and I believed them. I thought I was defective, fundamentally flawed to such an extent that even my own mother couldn't love me. But no one could tell me why. CPTSD is a relatively new construct and doesn't appear in the current version of the DSM, which is well known. PTSD is in the DSM-5 under a new category called trauma and stressor-related disorders. And because of this, and because of the overlap of symptoms with PTSD, CPTSD may be hard to diagnose correctly. Its symptoms are often much more intense and variable than those of PTSD and healthcare professionals may mistake it for other mental disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder. Symptoms. Flashbacks and nightmares. Depression or negative mood changes. Avoiding situations that remind you of the trauma. Physical effects like dizziness, nausea, shaking, and adrenaline rush. When remembering the trauma. Living in a continual state of high alert, which is termed hyperarousal. Perceiving the world as a dangerous place. Loss of trust in others or self. And sleeping or concentrating difficulties. Easily startled by loud noises or sudden appearances. I actually do have that particular one. I'm very jumpy. So I get easily like, dis- like shocked or surprised when somebody walks into the room. Some of the symptoms associated with CPTSD in particular is disturbances in self-organization such as emotional dysregulation, a loss of or or negative self-concept, and relational difficulties. CPTSD suffers experience changes in their brain. Sufferers, jeez, these guys with their spelling. CPTSD sufferers experience changes in the brain due to the continuous exposure to the flight or fight hormones, adrenaline, neoreprephrine, Oh, I hate these words. 
and cortisol. These hormones powerfully create changes in our biochemistry that help prepare us to physically save our own lives. Ah, neoepinephrine. There we go. Jeez. Adrenaline, which is a, also known as epinephrine, increases heart rate and respiration, increases blood flow to the brain and major muscle groups, stimulates a huge dump of sugar in the form of glucose into the bloodstream to fuel the muscles, inhibits production of insulin that would counteract the glucose surge, decreases our ability to feel pain. This adrenaline rush happens almost instantaneously, allowing us to run for our lives or turn and fight our attacker. The problem with adrenaline. The problem is this system evolved over millions of years as a way to react to sudden unexpected dangers. When we experience prolonged danger, the system is constantly pouring out adrenaline and then releasing cortisol to counteract the effects of adrenaline. Repeated exposure to adrenaline becomes addictive. People who become addicted to adrenaline are referred to as adrenaline junkies and may seek out thrills and shocks such as skydiving, racing, or watching horror movies to get the rush. Right. Other hormones in the overstimulated brain. In addition to, this, to its addictive nature, constant exposure to adrenaline and the nor, norepinephrine, norepinephrine the, and cortisol that go along with it taxes the system and it begins to wear down our organs. The prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain behind the forehead, can't regulate the excessive amounts of norep norepinephrine released by the amygdala in a, in a continuously stressed system, and the PFC begins to lose its ability to discern the severity of a given threat. In other words, being tapped on the shoulder can create the same physical reaction as bite a shark attack. Studies have indicated that the PFC can undergo physical changes as a result of repeated exposure to stress, including decreases in volume of some of its areas and a loss of overall cohesiveness. These decreases may be part of why PFC function is impaired in people with CPTSD. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why there's a lot of evidence coming out that a lot of ADHD diagnosis may actually be due to CPTSD. That's why. It's the similarities in the changes in the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, excuse me, not lobe. This is it. There's so much evidence now that is coming out. I seriously recommend if you have ADHD and you believe you have experienced any sort of trauma or neglect or abuse as a child, I would definitely recommend talking to it to someone like a psychologist or psychiatrist or your doctor and check to see if this is what is going on. The improvements are immense if you do it right. Anyways, okay. Continuing. I had an MRI last fall because I was experiencing a number of cognitive problems that had increased dramatically without explanation. Inability to make decisions, forgetting words, or where I put objects, getting lost while driving, wanting to scream all night long and bang my head on the wall, etc. I feared I was experiencing an early form of dementia. The MRI showed significant shrinkage and loss of integrity of white matter in my brain, as well as abnormalities in my prefrontal lobe. See, again, here we go. The MRI results stunned me. No one had ever suggested that there might be a physical reason for the many mental health challenges I had been facing, except for bipolar disorder, which my psychiatrist insisted I must have because of my emotional dysregulation. Since the MRI, I've researched more on white matter and mental health. There aren't a lot of studies, lot of studies yet, but more are coming. In addition to cognitive problems, changes in white matter integrity have been linked to executive function disorders, addictive behaviors, personality changes, and even the propensity towards being a night owl, which apparently she is. All right. The amygdala becomes overactive and increases in volume as a result of being bombarded by retreated, repeated trauma. Its continuous release of neoepinephrine 
eventually causes hyperarousal, which is an emotional state that leaves sufferers vulnerable to being triggered by anything remotely reminding them of their trauma. Seeing a similar story on TV, passing someone who looks similar to their assailant on the street, hearing a loud noise or seeing sudden movement, or imagining riding in taxi with a janky driver. Not sure what janky means. Uh, and then hypervigilance, a physical state where the sufferer is constantly jumpy, on edge, or nervous. They are on high alert at all times, seeing potential threats where they may not exist, and experiencing extreme wakefulness and chronic insomnia. One of the duties of the prefrontal cortex is to control inappropriate physical action, impulsive movement. See, again, there's this is more evidence that a lot of ADHD could be very well CPTSD when it isn't needed. Since the PFC becomes impaired when overexposed to norepinephrine, a person suffering from CPTSD may become less able to control their physical reactions upon being triggered, resulting in angry outbursts or violence, or attacking people with pens. The near constant release of adrenaline actually creates embedded neural pathways in the brain, which make it hard for the brain to respond in any new ways to trauma. Blood vessels in the body become damaged from constant swelling and we get high blood pressure, raising our risk for stroke and heart disease. We, all, we may also experience insomnia, headaches, and anxiety. We can gain weight or develop diabetes due to the presence of excess glucose in the bloodstream and the impairment of the insulin response. Help for mitigating symptoms of CPTSD. Diagnosis and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and CPTSD should only be done by a qualified mental health professional. Do not diagnose yourself off the internet. Treatment is complicated and often difficult. No matter which form of PTSD you have, recovering from it takes time and effort. Medication can be very effective for many PTSD sufferers, particularly antidepressants. Some other things that may help include mindfulness practice mindfulness is a way of being present in your life there are many different opportunities and techniques for experiencing mindfulness slow walking the purposeful the pur purposeful performance of chores concentration on sensory experiences while eating mindful breathing many good resources are available if you want to learn mindfulness techniques some cptsd sufferers are not able to tolerate being in the moment with their feelings related to their trauma Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is the gold standard for the treatment of CPTSD and trauma-related disorders. Sessions with a counselor trained in trauma response might be more effective than classic talk therapy, though many do find relief this way, particularly if the trauma isn't too deep-seated. In my case, this lady, of course, psychotherapy has done little, if anything, to relieve my symptoms though the medication just prescribed to accompany it has definitely helped. Exposure therapy. This technique is used extensively to treat phobias and involves gradually introducing the stimulus in a clinical setting, then working through the feeling, feelings that arise with the therapist. This kind of therapy does seem to help retrain the PFC to lower perceived threats in everyday situations. It would seem to be more applicable to cases of PTSD, which usually have a single trauma event, rather than CPTSD, which has multiple chronic trauma events. I, she's never been treated with it. I don't even know why I said that. Okay. And meditation. Of all the interventions that I've tried over the years, this one seems to be the most effective, aside from medication. Meditation has been proven to help make the amygdala less reactive and to improve the PFC's ability to delineate, delineate genuine from imagined threats. Meditation practice doesn't have to be formal or complicated. Just finding a comfortable, safe place to sit quietly, closing my eyes, and taking some slow, some deep, slow breaths does wonders for my anxiety levels. When I'm able to calm down and let the adrenaline dissipate, I find that the confusion and fear I feel when I've been triggered soon melt away. Before long, sometimes within a few minutes, I'm able to return to what I was doing prior to the spike and behave like a normal person again. 
If you think you might have trauma, a trauma related disorder, start by seeing your doctor and then they can help refer you to a psychiatrist or trauma therapist who can diagnose and treat you. Though the changes to our brain tend to be permanent, which I said again, I disagree with, it is really possible to improve our quality of life if we are we're willing to do the work. All right. And there we go. That actually is a really good article. And I kind of wish I had read it before I started because I was not aware of how much it reminds me of the ADHD CPTSD thing. I could have used some of this in my previous episode. Anyway. All right. So there you go. Um, This, yeah, like our brains obviously are affected. And when we are a young kid, a child, you know, and our brains are just starting to develop. And as they say, our first five years of our life is when we learn the most and we take the most in that we're going to take in our entire life. That's how we learn to walk, talk, imitate people, our parents, you know. Um, We learn most of our behaviors and our personality and we develop the brain the most for our survival and this is how we learn to to grow up and then as we age we continue to develop but the majority of our development has happened within the first five years so imagine in that first five years and i'm sure you know you can because if you're a cptsd survivor and you've dealt with trauma and abuse and neglect from parents or someone else while you were a kid at that age that it affects you and your brain develops in a different way because the trauma and the memories and the abuse is being developed and gets, you know, it's in that, it's in your brain and it's not, you know, you're not, you're unfortunately your brain is not going to exactly develop like a a normal childhood or a child who has a a happy, safe childhood whose needs are met and and is loved and cared for uh, all the time. So, We need to find a way to try and discover what's going on in there and then do the hard work and attempt to heal and repair the damage that's been done. And by reprogramming and rewriting our neural pathways in our mind over time, it can get done. It can happen. And it's, but like I said earlier, it just takes a hell of a lot of work. It's not an easy thing to do. You got to be tough. You got to be vigilant with yourself. You can't let people, you know, run your life. You are the one who's in charge. And that's the bottom line. Like, there's a lot more I could say, obviously, but I don't want to get too deep into it because then I'm going to get way off track here. But anyway. You can heal. If you do the work, you can heal. You can get better. But understand that your trauma that you experienced as a child repeatedly as you grew up has changed the way your brain is structured. The development is different. And that that prefrontal cortex in the front of your brain has had changes done to it because of this. So, and I said this already, If you were diagnosed with ADHD and you believe that you have experienced childhood trauma repeatedly at abuse, neglect, etc., go and see if you have CPTSD because there's a good chance that your your ADHD is actually because of your CPTSD abuse. Okay, guys, that's it. Season one is complete. I... (sighs) I'm amazed. You know, when I started this back on the 11th of September of last year, I honestly didn't know where I'd be going with this. I wanted to help people. I wanted to give those who were struggling and scared and feeling alone and, you know, not sure how to handle things like uh, ADHD and CPTSD. And I... I wanted to show people my own experiences, how it affects my life and how I live and what it does for me 
both for in a positive way and in a negative way against me. In the time frame since I've done the episodes, I've had a lot of struggles. Um, I've had a ton of relationship issues. I've had a lot of trauma issues, growth, regression, um, mistakes, relearning. I've had a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I was diagnosed as an inattentive ADHD. I am very likely someone who is on the autistic spectrum and at the high functioning, so an HSD. And of course I've got my CPTSD, which I'm really learning a lot about and I'm making a lot of progress. And right now, the biggest thing in my life is trying to repair my relationship because it really is in a state of flux and there's a lot of issues because of my trauma. And my partner is learning some things about herself as well. And we hope to make a lot of progress in the near future. And I honestly can't wait to explore a lot of that with you. And it's exciting, but it's also a little scary. But I'm very confident that I can do this. And I'm extremely happy that I have been doing these podcasts for all of you that listen to me. If you have any questions for me, like I, there is one thing I have noticed is that I don't get a lot of responses. Um, I, I do, I have had some people that have commented, uh, whether it's through messaging on the sites, uh, I've received a couple emails. Um, I have people on Twitter who have made some comments, but for the most part, not a lot of people have really made any responses or given me any kind of response. I know I get a lot of listeners. Um, my podcast has gone over 30,000. Um, I have quite a few people who listen to me regularly on all the different uh, platforms like Apple, Google, um, there's Spotify, uh, there's like a few other ones, um, iHeart, Amazon, they're, they're, everybody's listening. And I honestly would love to hear more comment, like more response. I want to hear what you have to think about episodes. I want to hear your ideas, your thoughts. Um, I want to get in touch with you. I want to talk about anything. Like. I know that CPTSD is difficult to talk about because a lot of it can be triggering. And the last thing I really want to do is re-trigger somebody because of their discussion discussion about it. But if you feel strong enough and you believe that you can talk about it and it won't trigger you, by all means, contact me. Get in touch with me and we can discuss it. If if you need help, if you need advice, if you're looking for a doctor or you need something to, you know, to start with, give me a call. Get, not, don't call me, unfortunately. I, I really don't want that, but because it's a lot of privacy issues and spam is big time out there. But anyway, email me, um, message me, uh, give me a, a comment, like rate the show. When, when you're listening to it, don't forget to give me a rating. Um, every platform ha- allows you to give a rating. Don't forget to do that. So if you want to contact me, contact me. Don't be afraid to do it. I'm a very likable, very nice, very understanding guy. I listen well. Um, I'm not someone who judges anybody. I just want to help. I want to give you guys an opportunity to feel listened to, feel heard. Um, If you're scared, I can give you some help. I can give you some advice. I can direct you in the right direction if you need it. I will do whatever it takes to help people out there who are listening to my show. All right, so there are a number of ways to contact me. You can email me. The address is livingwithadhd and cptsd at gmail.com. You can contact me on Twitter. My handle is at ADHD and CPTSD. You can go to my website, 
It's www.livingwithadhdandcptsd.ca. You can contact me there. I have now set up a Patreon account. If you would like to go and support my pay, my business making podcasts, you can go and you can become a member. You get, depending on the tier that you select, you get exclusive access to bonus material. You get to be a member, obviously, you get to join the group. And if you join my loyalty program, you can get merchandise. There are, it's a, it's a one year program. Every three months, as for every month that you are a member, you get an item. The first item is a sticker of my logo. You know, I know a lot of you going, woohoo, but as you continue going onwards, the next thing that you get is a mug. With my stretched out logo, it's a little different. It's kind of cool. I really think it's neat. I tried, you know, I looked at it and I thought, hmm, this list is perfect. And then if you continue on the next few months, you get a t-shirt with my brand new logo that will be revealed at the beginning of the new season. And if you get to the final month, final three months, a year later, you get a nice hoodie with the logo on it. And you get merchandise. It's amazing. And so I really, really recommend becoming a member. Sign up, go to patreon.com slash LWAC, which is living with ADHD and CPTSD. Again, that's patreon.com slash LWAC. You can also go to ko-fi.com, ko-fi.com slash living with ADHD and CPTSD. You can donate there. Any amount is great. Um, you can become a subscriber to Apple Podcasts. It's a dollar a month and you get exclusive access. You get early access to all episodes, exclusive access to bonus episodes. It's, a, it's an amazing deal. It's a dollar a month or you can do a year, which is $9.49 for a year subscription. It's really well worth it. Plus, there's a ton of new episodes that are bonus related and there's going to be many, many new bonus episodes coming out in the next season so there's going to be a ton to listen to and there's a lot of more personal deeper more serious related episodes that are available for bonus podcasts all right everybody thanks for listening to the first season i really do appreciate it i love you guys all you're all amazing and thank you for sticking around and listening to 101 season one episodes i know that's a lot and i truly appreciate it i'm so glad that you guys are here listening to me if you have anything to say just let me know all right talk to you next season bye everybody